Well, first of all, um, good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. I would like to start, um, I mean, the whole presentation, in fact, is, is built uh, around the possibility to answer this question, which is the question of the symposium. Can architecture be political? I would like to answer this, this question uh, in two uh, antithetical uh, ways, which I think are both, you know, although, I mean, it might sound like a contradiction or a contradictory answer, I think both ways are here necessary. My first answer to this question is that architecture cannot be political. And this has to do with the way architecture, not as an object, as a, as a form, but architecture as a profession, as a liberal art, has been historically developed as a practice that largely depends on what I would call ideology of consensus. To the point that we can say that architecture has been institu institutionalized as a practice not only as something that depends on consensus, but also something that is the embodiment uh, of consensus. Architecture cannot be political also because the way architecture today, but I would say historically, has been organized where, unlike other arts, the division of labor has fragmented the way in which uh, the architecture, in fact, is uh, produced. But also how uh, architecture cannot be political in the way architecture is presented and discussed very often in the public sphere, uh, such as, for example, uh, something that all of us have been witnessing the last week, uh, the uh, uh, Guggenheim Museum competition, where in fact uh, a competition with a massive uh, response has been used uh, to uh, justify, uh, to construct consensus around a very controversial uh, building, which is basically the new Guggenheim building in, uh, in, in, uh, in Helsinki. So in a way, uh, I, I think that precisely because historically architecture has been organized with this professional structure and with this goal and with this presentation in the public spheres, I think it's very hard for architecture uh, could, uh, to be political. My second uh, answer is that in a way, architecture is always uh, political. And of course, we can uh, argue this uh, answer in two ways. One, which is very banal, and one maybe is a little bit more uh, structural. Uh, the very banal answer, of course, that uh, being an, the architect, basically an, an entrepreneur, and today actually an entrepreneur of uh, himself, uh, the architect has to always be political all the time to navigate your style, territory of clients, of, uh, of patronage, uh, of commissions uh, and also of colleagues. Um, of course, uh, the, the phenomenology of this uh, profession is very political and today we know how, especially within post fordist modes of production, the politicization of labor is a fundamental perversion, I would say, of the political, so that we have to be political all the time and that's actually why we think that the idea of grand politics is an unbearable farce. At the same time, architecture is uh, always political uh, in its, I would argue, in its most uh, tiny details, uh, in its even most uh, modest uh, job, because any architectural element, architectural form, always imply a subject. And of course, uh, that uh, in a way, any architectural element from the most uh, even banal one always implied a mode of life, a mode of being in space. And in that sense, uh, even the most apolitical element of architecture is always political. So architectural form always address uh, a spatial condition, and any spatial condition always imply an idea of the political. Uh, Carl Schmitt actually famously said that any idea of space imply an idea of the political, and any idea of the political always imply an idea of space. So in that sense, uh, architecture by patterning, framing space, even one, one uh, doesn't want to be uh, political, always address inevitably an idea of uh, political space. So here we have a paradox. Architecture is both uh, a depoliticizing uh, profession, at the same time architecture itself is always uh, political. So to solve this contradiction, or perhaps to attempt to solve this contradiction, I would argue that while architectural form is always political, architecture as discipline, 
and his profession has always tended to be apolitical. So in a way, I would almost argue that architecture as a discipline has been almost uh, in institutionalized, invented, uh, to depoliticize uh, uh, architecture as one of the most fundamental embodiments uh, of the political uh, within the city. So architecture is uh, an ideology of consensus. Uh, architecture as profession, as discipline, as theory. I mean, until actually the recent enter of critical theory within uh, architecture, any architectural theory from Vitruvius to Le Corbusier has been really an attempt to uh, formalize architecture as an ideology of consensus. This is actually very evident uh, in perhaps not the most, the first theory of architecture, but the first, the oldest theory we know about architecture, which is uh, Vitruvius' uh, uh, 10 books, uh, which, uh, as you might know, actually uh, is considered a classic of architecture, but it's a, it's a book that addressed uh, primarily the city and its spatial organization. And actually, in the book, architecture occupy a very limited amount uh, of the book. And of course, uh, Vitruvius is definitely the first to present architecture as a spatial knowledge, almost as an encyclopedic uh, description of how the city uh, and the spatial environment should be uh, organized. Vitruvius really insists uh, on the idea of organization in the idea of organization as the only way to make uh, architecture, the seed itself, a body, a coherent body, a word that he obsessively repeats uh, in the book. So architecture is really presented as the uh, most uh, powerful embodiment of this uh, idea of uh, consensus. But it's very interesting to understand when Vitruvio, Vitruvius uh, conceptualized such idea of architecture. We know that uh, Vitruvius dedicates uh, his 10 books uh, to the uh, Emperor uh, Augustus uh, at the end uh, of a very tormented civil war that in fact marked the passage uh, uh, within ancient Rome from the Republic uh, to the Empire. And in fact, uh, Vitruvius even uh, refers uh, to this uh, very tragic uh, context uh, in which he writes uh, the Architettura at the very beginning of, uh, the, uh, of, of the Ten Books. And in fact, he refers uh, uh, to uh, Augustus uh, as the inspirator of such encyclopedic uh, construction of the discipline uh, of architecture. And we actually, we, we see what is the real uh, motivation of such encyclopedic uh, definition of the discipline of architecture. The idea to transform architecture as a discursive uh, knowledge, uh, able to construct a coherent idea of, of space, which of course uh, re refers really to the effort of the Emperor Augustus to pacify, basically, the, uh, the uh, Roman Empire. It's not by chance that uh, Vitruvius, uh, in his book, talk about calendars, sundials, uh, all efforts that the, the uh, empire uh, took in order to reform structurally uh, the very managerial administrative condition uh, of the empire. So we can almost argue uh, that with uh, the 10 books, uh, uh, design, because this is really what is at stake in Vitruvius' uh, understanding of architecture, not so much architecture as an object, but architecture as a practice. So design replaces politics. This has been always the tendency in any architectural theory until uh, recently, and I think this is for me one of the fundamental problems of design uh, today, the tendency that design is always advanced as something that either uh, has to enable and sometimes preempt a possibility of, of uh, politics. Uh, so design, uh, in a way, in this kind of uh, codification of architectural theory, design replaces uh, politics. But of course, as we have seen in the case of Vitruvius, that he writes this uh, uh, book uh, at the very uh, end of a very tormented uh, civil war, a very tormented conflict, uh, we always have to consider this tendency of architecture to be the embodiment of an ideology of consensus versus the possibility of conflict. So the ideology of consensus is always uh, contraposed to the reality uh, of conflict. And I would argue that the political in architecture lies precisely in this dialectic, between its being uh, the attempt to embody an idea of consensus and all, how this embodiment always sits in the volcano of a possible conflict. Perhaps the most uh, uh, radical uh, and I would say most interesting representation of this inherent conflict of, of architecture uh, was actually a famous uh, 
statement by Le Corbusier, the famous out out uh, architecture and revolution. Actually, what you see here was the mock up of the cover of the book towards an architecture that uh, for, uh, at first Le Corbusier thought uh, to publish under the title Architectural Revolution, which would have been, I think, a much more interesting title instead of uh, uh, Version Architecture, which of course doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so, in a way here, actually, the, the, the conflict that is already uh, implicit in Nusha, in Vitruvius, theory of architecture, it, it's really fully exposed. And I think even more uh, in uh, uh, Le Corbusier's idea of planning, uh, as actually you see in his contribution to this very influential uh, French magazine, Plants, uh, uh, which in 1931 devoted one issue to the, uh, to the idea of war. And actually, as you can see, uh, Le Corbusier's uh, contribution is uh, titled with the rhetorical question, uh, War, Better to Build. So in a way, building is the only way in which a conflict, uh, the possibility of conflict, uh, can be avoided. And actually, this is for me really the most uh, uh, true, uh, of course, Le Corbusier never failed to be uh, politically incorrect. Although he's a very conservative thinker, he has this ability to really expose the problem in its most uh, brutal terms. And it's interesting to see how the golden age uh, of architects uh, being involved in, in city planning, uh, in, in creating uh, ideas of the city, uh, the 1920s and the early 30s, was in a way a response to the very conflictual situation in which the working class found itself uh, at that point. So here actually the, the dichotomy architecture revolution, especially in this idea of stability, the idea of, of the importance of planning uh, becomes very uh, crucial. So uh, in a way, uh, of course, this is, uh, Le Corbusier is the architect that really exposed this tension between architecture and politics in the most uh, sharpest uh, uh, terms. Uh, this is actually not, of course, we know the case of how architecture and, and urban design has been practiced uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 500 years since the advent of uh, modernity, which can be described, at least from the point of view of urban planning, urban design, and architecture, as a process in which politics becomes the police. Uh, actually, it's interesting that both the word politics and police, which, as you know, is an institution that controls the city, uh, do, do not confront but control the city, share the same etymology, which of course is their object, uh, the city, it's the organization of the city. And of course, in this kind of condition, which uh, of course becomes very strong with the rise of urbanization, uh, it's very difficult to define the terms, uh, like the case of Vitruvius or Le Corbusier, the terms of a political uh, confrontation. For example, uh, with the advent of the theory of urbanization from Nicolas de la Mer, Traté de la Police, which actually was inspired by architectural theatres, but of course where the object uh, of study was no longer the theory of architecture and the theory of the city, but the possibility of controlling and managing something that never arrived to its final uh, form, to actually the Fonso Cerda, general theory of urbanization, which is actually posed as a way to rethink the city beyond the idea of the city and to really think the city as a kind of never-ending process of uh, production and, and distribution. And of course, within these terms, uh, the city actually becomes uh, what Lewis Mumford would call a mega machine, a gigantic apparatus where nor the dweller, neither the architect uh, as, as agent, uh, can really uh, understand what are the terms in which uh, a political rupture uh, can be uh, introduced. And we know that this is really the, the, the defined uh, by a lot of uh, uh, political scientists and, and philosophers at the moment where politics essentially become government. And of course, within government, it's difficult to understand how to uh, find the cracks uh, within which uh, a new hegemonic uh, discourse can be established. However, uh, I also believe that this, uh, let's say, uh, idea of politics and government has been often presented also by critical <coughs> theorists as a kind of end of history of politics, where actually politics is no longer uh, possible. And actually, it's interesting to see how in the history of uh, city making and architecture, there are examples that have been able to disrupt this condition of government, where in fact consensus uh, 
is distributed in this kind of very uh, multifarious field of apparatuses and, uh, and machine. Uh, there is actually one uh, particular example which I believe uh, is paradigmatic of a kind of uh, counter project towards the idea of urbanization and politics uh, as government, which is the famous uh, Red Vienna program uh, of social housing that was realized in the city of Vienna between the late uh, uh, 19th uh, to the early 1930s, where actually something like 60,000 uh, social housing were built uh, within uh, the city uh, in order to make visible the confrontation between the working class and its class adversary, the, the bourgeoisie. Actually, it's interesting, the social democrats took power uh, in, uh, in Vienna, the capital of Austria, but they did not have the majority at the, at the level of, uh, of on the parliament, at the, at the scale of the states, so, so they couldn't, couldn't actually rewrite the, uh, the rules uh, through which to confront their class adversary, and therefore housing became the only instrument through which they could basically construct some sort of form of uh, uh, political antagonism within the city. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, they uh, somehow made this project a tax-based, uh, let's say, uh, housing program. So in a way, the houses built for the workers were uh, the, uh, somehow the revenue that would come from land speculation. So they, in a way, they managed to, uh, to have both systems at the same time where one would feed uh, the other. And this was immediately visible also in the way these uh, houses were, uh, these housing units, which actually were very monumental, were positioned within the city. They did not actually have these housing projects in the outskirts, but really within the city, and, and using a very specific uh, form, which is the form of the courtyard, where in fact all the entrances to the houses are not actually from the street, as usually happen with uh, speculative developments, but actually from, uh, from within, uh, from within the houses, in fact from outside these houses, are very confrontational, they are not, uh, they, don't, they immediately pose a completely different image of the city than the other houses. Nevertheless, for the social democrats was very important this coexistence of the two housing conditions, so the, the, the struggle, the conflict, the temporality, the contingency of the conflict for them was a very key element to establish their hegemony uh, within the city. And of course, although it was a project of housing, uh, so something that uh, traditionally, even within Marxist uh, theory, was not seen as a political battleground to claim power of the city, over the city, uh, the spaces uh, of these uh, domestic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, buildings were monumentalized in order to make this the presence uh, of the politicization of housing not just as a kind of a solution of a problem, which of course was the shortage uh, of housing within the city, but also the possibility to claim a, an idea of representation, of class representation within the city, but always in dialogue, conflict uh, with the rest of the city. I think this is a very important element. The, the Red Vienna project was not trying to uh, replace, as it would happen with Soviet planning, replace actually the existing bourgeois city. The interest here is to create this kind of tension, this kind of uh, contrast. And I believe that this sort of, um, an example like this shows how uh, architecture is not uh, always uh, the embodiment uh, of uh, gov pure governmental politics. Uh, even from the scale of institutions and government, it can be a disruptive project that creates a sort of agonistic condition that uh, Chantal Mouffe argued in her, in her idea, uh, I would say, of the political. And of course, there are many other examples, even perhaps more subtle than this one, where in fact, from the point of view of institutions, not only from the point of view of dissidents or, let's say, uh, minority forces, there is an attempt to construct this kind of hegemonic uh, project. So now I would like to go back to the, to the question that I put, uh, let's say, at the beginning, to which I would like to give a final, hopefully not contradictory uh, answer. Can architecture be uh, political? I think that we can today answer to this question uh, by advancing two uh, projects. The first one would be uh, a thorough, uh, meticulous, uh, analytical rereading of architecture as a political project, where even the tiniest uh, detail, even the, mo the most uh, modest uh, architectural element uh, has always been invented focusing on a very specific subject and a very specific uh, form of life. 
I have to say that um, I found uh, very interesting uh, the brief that Rem Colas put forward in this year, Venice Biennale Architectural Elements, where his intention was to, to deconstruct architecture element by elements and trying to make a history of these, uh, let's say, very banal uh, arch uh, architectural elements that have been li largely used in the construction of the city. However, if I would criticize that brief, is that it totally missed the idea of the subject. The fact that these elements have been always, uh, they don't have an autonomous history, their history has been always uh, in relationship with the formation of specific uh, subject and specific uh, forms of life. So I think that this sort of literacy about architecture itself, uh, for me, is not a way to claim, of course, the disciplinary uh, boundary of architecture. On the contrary, it's a way to really see how architecture, in its deepest uh, essence uh, of an artifact, has been always a very powerful articulation of political interest especially when architecture claimed to not be political. But there is also another way in which we can uh, again repoliticize uh, architecture. This is actually an image of uh, uh, the so-called My uh, Brigade, brigade uh, Ems My and his collaborators, who actually represented uh, the idea of the modern uh, architect in the 1920s, betraying uh, his own uh, class, uh, the bourgeoisie, and ally uh, himself to the progressive forces of, of the working class. What is interesting that today, actually, uh, the architect himself has become basically a, a proletarian, or better, a cognitarian, who actually, uh, whose precarious conditions uh, uh, do not allow him or her to, uh, in fact, uh, be um, able to uh, reconstruct the political conditions within which architecture is produced, but again, I really found this uh, not as the end of history uh, of how architecture can be politicized, but really the ground, uh, the organization of the production of architecture as really the ground where perhaps uh, a kind of political project, uh, a project of political hegemony can be uh, reconstructed. Or wherever for me this uh, product, this condition through which architecture is produced are very important to uh, take in account uh, and they really imply to see the architect uh, not just as a, let's say, individual genius, or as today is very fashionable to say as public intellectual. I think a key uh, to reconstruct this politicization of architecture and of the subject of the architect is to really see the architect as producer. As producer that is able, of course, by being conscious of his or her condition, to modify structurally the condition through which architecture itself is actually today produced. Thank you very much.